policeman smiled and asked her, what's wrong? And so looking down and looking at the little girl and got to her eye level and he said, what can I do for you? And she said, could you tie my shoes? <laughs> Now the question, why did this little girl look to a policeman? She knew he could help. She knew that this man could be trusted. Now, let's change this theme a little bit for a second. Let's just say you're driving down the road. The speed limit's 55. You're doing 70. Not that you people would ever do such a thing because we don't speed, we just follow traffic, <laughs> as we might call it. And all of a sudden, as you're going down over the crest of a hill, comes a police car. And what happens? Everybody slows down real quick. Why does everybody slow down real quick? It's amazing how, as they pass, you can't get your eyes off your rear view mirror as you're looking because you don't want to see this. <laughs> Not that I ever have. <laughs> I stopped thinking, I thought he's asking for instructions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. I remember one time living in Florida, and I played, I don't put, I, if you didn't know, I played a few games of basketball in my life, and I would open the gyms late at night sometimes, a couple nights a week, for the police officers, the Broward County sheriffs. A lot of them worked in the jail, a lot of them, because it was the best time for them to play. And I was heading somewhere one night, I thought I beat the light. <laughs> Apparently I didn't. So I'm pulling, I go, oh! Of course, that fear goes, oh, I can't believe it. I'm thinking, oh, well. And I watched the police officer, and he had the book out already. And as he walks, I recognize him. And I wrote him, I said, hey, Jim, what's up? And he goes, high street. <laughs> you did that on purpose, didn't you? I said, no, I really didn't. I didn't see you. He said, you saw me. Get out of here. And I went, thank you, God. <laughs> I got the right police officer. But when we see this, we know that the police officer's not pulling us over just because he wants to help us in some way. It's not a big thing of trust. It's that we did something wrong. And because we did something wrong and we see these lights, all of a sudden fear steps in. We've been caught doing something wrong. We don't care who the police officer is. It might be your uncle. It could be a close friend. It could be someone you know. But they don't know who's behind the wheel of that police car. And it really doesn't seem to matter. Because that car represents the hand of judgment. And you've been doing something wrong, speeding, and now you're afraid. Like the story of a little girl who was, mother was tucking her into bed and she was about to turn the lights off when she heard a little trembling of a voice and said, Mommy, could you sleep with me tonight? And Mother smiling and kind of gave her a warm little hug and reinsured her tenderly and said, Dear, I can't. You know I have to sleep in Daddy's room. And as she's about to walk out the door, she heard a trembling voice and it said this, The big sissy. <laughs> <laughs> Fear. The Bible tells it that some fear is a good thing. In fact, the very first chapter of Proverbs, we're told this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is mentioned 18 times in the book of Proverbs. It's repeated so often because the writer of these Proverbs believed this kind of fear is so important to wisdom. I've looked at the 18 verses in Proverbs, and as I looked through them, I found this. I found that a vast majority of these verses taught that fearing God can have two very important benefits to those who are wise enough to understand them and to follow them. The first benefit of fearing God is it helps me, it helps us to avoid evil. 
Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. If I fear God, I'll avoid all evil things. That's what Solomon wrote in Proverbs. In fact, I'll hate evil things. But if I don't, then I won't. If I don't fear God, I won't hear evil. It's simple as that. There's a story about a preacher who worked overtime basically trying to get this non-Christian to come to church. It was a big church, a huge church. And eventually, he talked to his friend. He learned about Jesus Christ. He accepted him as the Lord and Savior. He's baptized. Everything was going great. And after three, four months, the man stopped coming to church. Frustrated, the preacher, because he was a good friend, and he says, I, I need to know why. Because he said, I spent a lot of time with him. I thought we were on the same page. And so he goes and finds his friend and wants to know, why did you stop coming? And the friend explained that he decided to quit the church, quit the church, when one of the leaders in the church got up to do a meditation. The church was large enough, he said, that this new Christian had never noticed this man before, this leader of the church. And he recognized the man as one of the managers at the place that he works. And he said, this Christian leader of yours, you want to know what his reputation at the plant is? He said, this man steals everything that is not nailed down. He takes tools home. He takes paper. He steals everything. The man's a crook. He's a thief. And when I saw him come up, I didn't want to go to that church anymore. And when the preacher's friend realized that, it hurt the preacher. Now, aside from the fact that this is probably wasn't the best way to handle the issue being a new Christian, but here's the situation. Was that Christian leader a God-fearing man? Of course he wasn't. He didn't care what God thought. He didn't care about his behavior, if it turned people towards Christ or not. He frankly didn't fear God, so he did not hate evil. And if you don't fear God, then you don't hate evil. In fact, you're going to eventually embrace evil. I read of a church recently where one of the deacons had committed adultery, and everybody in town knew about it. Everybody in church knew about it. And when the deacon was removed from office, the board held a special meeting where the ex-deacon was in attendance. And the board decided, let's put him back into office. Why would they do that? Well, it was suspected that he had threatened to sue the church if they didn't put him back as the deacon. And so, was the church fearing God or were they fearing man? Were they so afraid of being sued that they forget of proper fear or were they more concerned about fearing man? They feared the deacon so they did not hate evil and what did they embrace? They embraced evil. And we see this over and over again. Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil, hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Now these people that we talked about, some of these churches that we talked about, don't fear God because they embrace evil. We look at our society today and where are we headed. The things that we allow, the things that we say, because there's not a fear of God. And when we don't fear God, then it's easy to embrace evil. There's choices that we're going to make one way or another. So fearing God properly will help us in our own lives to avoid evil. The second is the proper fear of God will help me live a long life. It says in Proverbs 10, 27, Fear the Lord lengthens one's life but the years of the wicked will be cut short. Now you're saying, how does that work? Well, let's look at the wonderful world of electricity. There's a plug, and I know there's power in that plug. I know I can plug in lamps, I can plug in fans, microwaves, you name it, phone chargers, all different things are going to be powered through this plug, and that's electricity. 
I can go to the hospital. There was my work in the hospital. You know how important electricity is to the hospitals. You find all kinds of devices plugged in. And those devices can monitor people's health and they can save lives because of that. So you could say that the power offered in those wall sockets, electricity can add pleasure to your life. But it can also, it can add years to your life. But I do have an object lesson today. I do have a butter knife. Maybe get Joey up here to stick it in a light socket here, just to see if I did this, you know <laughs> it's not going to be good. Because you know what's going to happen if I do this. <laughs> my hair will frizz a little bit. Could even stop my heart. So we have to understand that in a wall socket, there is power. Power that we can use. Power that can not only bring life, but as you know anything about electricity, it can also bring death. If I'm wise, and I have the proper fear for that power, it's going to add years to my life. It's going to make my life better. I'm going to be able to do so many other things. Now, I never ever put a knife into a wall socket. Why not? The same reason on a nice cold winter day I don't stick my tongue to a frozen flagpole either because I know exactly what's going to happen. I don't have to experience those things to be afraid of them. I know the power of electricity. I don't have to test that power because I know it's there. You see, when I fear God, I realize that there are certain things that God hates. And if God hates something, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do those things that God hates. Because if God hates something, that's good enough for me. I don't need to question that. What makes God angry about sin is that it can hurt us. Our sin not only can hurt us, but it can also hurt others around us. I don't have to understand how my sin hurts people any more than I have to understand how electricity could hurt people. I just have to know God hates something, therefore I shouldn't go there. Let's just say I left this knife out. Church is over and you see one of these little kids around us walking with it and walking to a light socket. Now, I know everybody here would stop that child from doing it. You're not going to go, shh, 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 watch this, this is going to be funny. <laughs> He's going to learn a lesson the hard way, something that my dad would like to do sometimes. But if we stopped him right away and sat him down and took the knife away and started giving him a lecture on electricity and what electricity could do, you know you're going to lose them. They're not going to understand that. What I do is I just take the knife away. Now, if it was my, my own kids, it might be a little more forceful. I'm going to not only take that knife away, but I want to make sure I instill a lesson not only to fear the electricity, but also to fear the old man. And I will put that little bit of fear in them. Yeah, I know with my, where we lived in Florida, one of the big things is when, I, when you hear me call your name, you better freeze. And I instilled that in them because we lived on a road. And as they come darting out, I don't have time to call their name four times. And they learn, kind of the hard way a little bit, that I say, stop, you better, boom, stop, drop, roll, what you got to do, but you better stop. Now, with my kids in electricity, they may not understood electricity, but they didn't understand they needed to fear me. And if I love them, that's probably just what I'm going to do. I want them to think twice about putting a knife in that socket. And you see, God's the same way with us. He's not some celestial ogre out there waiting for us just to do something wrong so he can just drop the hammer on us and boom, I was waiting for you to do something wrong. He is a father who wants to protect us from evil. If you're a Christian, you know you're his child. You know he's your heavenly father. And just like any parent, if he sees that you're doing something you shouldn't, he'll get your attention one way or another. As the book of Hebrews says, 
Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So I fear God, and I'm going to build that wall between what is good and what is evil. Everything on one side is going to be bad, and I don't want to go there. On the other side is the good stuff. That's where I want to be. That's the side of the wall that I need to be on. On this side of the wall is like being that little girl asking that policeman to just tie her shoe. She has no fear. She knows that's what she needs to do. But on the other side of the wall, we're now we're facing the danger of judgment and punishment. Those who live on that other side of the wall get exactly what they deserve, either from the hand of God or from the ultimate pain of their lifestyle. As Proverbs 13, 15 says, good judgment wins favor, but the way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. So here on this side of the wall is where I want to stay, because on the good side of the wall, I have life. On the other side of the wall is death. And so Proverbs tells us that fearing God the right way is healthy. A healthy fear of God leads to repentance, and it leads us to change our lives. And if I have this kind of fear of God, it will protect me from evil. It will lead me to a lifestyle which ends up adding years to my life. This is a healthy kind of fear. But just as there's a healthy kind of fear, there's also an unhealthy way to fear God. Just as there is this kind of fear can drive us to change our lives to please God, an unhealthy fear can lead us to hide from God. If we look at the book of Genesis and we're told the story of Adam and Eve, they sinned, they ate from the tree they weren't supposed to, they fear God. Why did they fear God? God. As we read out of Genesis, and it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? And man answered Adam and said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid. If we continue in sin, if we refuse to fear God the way we should, we can end up fearing God and end up not understanding what God wants to do. We don't understand the love that God has for us. And we'll find some way to hide from God, just as Adam and Eve did. Second Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. In other words, if I end up doing something I ought not to do, and I fear God the way I should, I will have a godly sorrow that will make me want to repent of my sins and what I've done. It will prompt me to abandon the things that I need to stop doing because I know they're wrong. And it will bring me God's salvation and leave me with no regrets. But I like how this finishes. But worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sour, sour, that word, <laughs> is different than godly sorrow. And too many times as we look at worldly sorrow, we try to hide from God. We try to hide from what we're trying to do. This type of fear will ultimately lead to nothing but death and sin. I want godly sorrow. I want to fear God that makes me want to change me. I want to fear God that says, I love you. I want you better. I want to fear God that says, I have a purpose for you. It's not about you. It's all about me, and I have a purpose for you. I want to make sure I please God. I want to know that I don't have to worry about anything. No regrets. I like that. Now there's one more aspect about fearing God. In this world, we're going to fear something. 
something we're going to fear. It's unavoidable. It's going to happen. But the Bible tells us we have a choice to what we fear. Our choice is we're either going to fear God or we're going to fear man. That's our choice. And there are going to be times when we're going to be afraid of standing up for our Christianity. We're going to be afraid that if we stand up for God, if we stand up for our faith, that we might lose a job, or we might lose a promotion, or we won't get a spot on the team. We're afraid of losing respect. We're afraid of maybe losing some kind of affection of someone we might care about. And so sometimes we'll be tempted just to deny our faith. Because we can't be afraid of these things. We can't. And because we're tempted to deny, we're tempted to leave our Christianity at the church building. I'll show up on Sunday, but don't ask me to take that anywhere. I pick it up at the door, and I'll leave it at the door. We can't do that. Because Jesus said... Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. A person who fears what man will do or say or think will ultimately do whatever is necessary to distance themselves from Jesus. They'll find ways not to confess him. They'll find ways to deny who Jesus is because they'll fear God more They'll fear man more than they'll fear God. But when we fear God, we have no need to fear anything else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you will fear everything else. One man observed, it's only the fear of God that can deliver us from the fear of man. Only God. If I fear God, I have no need to fear anything else. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. The one who rests content, untouched by trouble. Nothing can touch me. Nothing can threaten me. When I put the proper fear of God in my heart. Psalms 103 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God loves those who fear him properly. He has compassion on them. Like a father has compassion for his own children. And because God loves us and his compassion on us is nothing else can touch us. Nothing else can touch us. And then what happens? God will protect us just the same way that a father will protect his children. The same way. You see, Proverbs 3 says, then you'll go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be at your side and he'll keep your foot from being snared. God will be my confidence. When I fear him and seek to honor him in all that I do, I know he's got my back. I can have, I don't have to have fear. I need to fear no man. I don't need to fear any institution if I fear God in the proper way because I know he'll protect me. I know I have a purpose. I know where I'm going because I know I've been built for eternity. I was put on this earth for eternity. I'm only here for a short time, but I know what God promises me when the proper fear is there because I want to please him. I don't fear angels. Remember what angels will always say as you read the Bible. Every time they appear, everybody would be like, froze. And what was it that they always said to whoever they appeared? Fear there you go. Fear not, do not be afraid. Why wouldn't these normal people be afraid? Because these angels have been sent to God-fearing people. As powerful and imposing as an angel could be, there is no way they'd ever hurt anyone who feared God. I don't have to fear Satan. 
As it says in 1 John 5.18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. If you are born again, if you are his child, you have nothing to fear because we're going to stop in sin. The one who is born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. I don't have to fear what man can do to me. I don't have to fear the past. I don't have to fear the present. I don't have to fear the future. Paul wrote, for I'm convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor participalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When we fear God properly, the man got our back. You know he's got your back. We can trust him because we know he's there to protect us. We know he's there to love us. And in the same way, if we fear God the way we should, we know he's bigger than anything else in this universe. And he's big enough that when we hit those storms of life, we always know we're safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. So the question is, we finish here today. What do you fear? Do you fear God? Or do you fear the opinions of others? God has not left us in the dark to wonder and guess. God has clearly revealed our purpose. God has clearly revealed his purpose for our lives in the Bible his foundation. It's our owner's manual explaining why we are alive and what to expect in the future. It explains things that no self-help book, no philosophy book, no kind of any kind of psychological session, I don't care, no pump-up movie. It doesn't even come close to the owner's manual of what we're supposed to do. It explains better than anything. There are many who put off becoming a Christian because they're afraid of what their friends are going to say. There are a lot of people who put off being baptized because they're afraid it might upset my family. God is not the starting point of your life. God is the source of your life. And to discover your purpose in life, you have to turn to the Word of God. Not the world's wisdom, not the world's opinion, but we need to turn to God in his word. Because if you fear God this morning, you're going to realize one major thing. You're going to realize that God loves you so much, so much, that he gave his son to die for us. That's how much God loves us. And if you choose him, he'll save you through those storms of life. He'll hold you so close to his side because he'll make you his child. He will help you discover who you are. He'll help you discover that you have a purpose here on this earth, a purpose that has been you were born with, a purpose that God knew he had set and you'd be way before you ever thought of. God has a purpose for your life. And it begins with the proper fear of God because that proper fear of God is going to get us closer to him. Like a father who wants the best for his children. He'll help you discover who you are. He's going to help you develop a relationship with his son. He's going to help us understand that he wants us to have everlasting life. 